But I thought today I'd start on a positive note for our preach. Everyone always is trying to deceive you. Yeah, just what would be really cheery, just because like that's what we like, isn't it? <laughs> you are constantly being sold things. And sometimes this is explicit for the exchange of money. You see adverts, you see your salespeople. And in some ways, I think this is the lesser of two evils when you know someone's selling you things. But actually, sometimes people selling you things is more subtle than that. Sometimes they're selling you a lifestyle or a worldview or a political opinion. And in a lot of ways, this way is more deceptive, more cunning, and it's happening constantly. And frankly, it's even worse than it used to be because we're so much more exposed to ads. You know, in the 1970s, so basically forever ago, um, the average person was exposed to between 500 and 1,600 ads. In the 1970s, it was between 500 and 1,600 ads. Anyone want to take a guess at what the figure was for 2021? Someone want to shout out? Over 1,000? 100,000, 10,000? Well, for 2021, the figure was between 6,000 and 10,000. We don't have any data for 2023, but 10,000 ads a day, that's insane. Like, no wonder it affects our mind. And I think part of the reason for this increase from you know, 1,600 to 10,000 ads is how much time we spend on screens. I think this is quite a big deal for our children as well. You know, the average eight to 10 year old spends six hours on a screen a day. The average 11 to 14 year old, that's nine hours in front of a screen a day. And the average 15 to 18 year old spends seven and a half hours a day. So many of my peers, so that's people in their like early 20s, can't sleep unless they're watching something, like online, like they watch Netflix to go to sleep. That just constantly always being plugged in thing is insane, isn't it? But it doesn't matter if you're young or if you're old or your lifestyle choices. We're being bombarded all the time with people selling us things. And it's a bit bleak, isn't it? And they're all pretty much selling the same thing, whether they want your money or they want to change your view on something or how you think or how you feel. They're all telling you that your life at the moment is unfulfilling. And this thing that I have, it will fill the gap. It will make you happier, it will make you healthier, it will make you sexier, it will give you more friends. And even the ones with the best intentions, they might change how you feel for a while, but in the end, they're just gonna leave you as unfulfilled as you were before. Or maybe even more unfulfilled because you tried another strategy and it didn't work again. And it never works because the problem isn't the car you drive. It's not the extra pounds you put on over Christmas. The problem is so much deeper than that. And actually, it's universal to all human beings. And it's all to do with our broken relationship with God. I don't want you to all think now that I'm this scared person that's out of touch with the world and is running away from all screens and the internet and all ads and all the rest of them. Obviously, not everyone and everything has evil intentions, but everyone and everything is influencing you. And it is important that we're wary of the things that are affecting how we feel and how we think and what we do. And I see some of you in this congregation thinking, oh yeah, some people, they're easily deceived, but not me. Those adverts don't get to me. I see right through them. I am not easily persuaded. I just want to challenge you on that because are you really that sure? <laughs> Have you never bought something that wasn't strictly essential or made a crazy lifestyle change like went on the keto diet? <laughs> Have you never watched something that someone recommended to you or bought a t-shirt because something similar looked good on someone else? This marketing and this influence is subtle and it's clever and it gets to everyone. So there's someone trying to deceive you all the time. <laughs> Just for, just, it will get more hopeful, I promise. So if you want to open your Bibles to Colossians 2, we're looking at verses 6 to 23. And we know from the rest of our series that this is a letter from Paul to the church in Colossae. 
There are many people in the church in Colossae being led astray. They're being deceived by new ideas from the world around them and also from ideologies within the church trying to overemphasize rule keeping and religion. So Paul gives them a firm warning and explains how to protect themselves from the deceptions they are exposed to. So it's quite a long process, so buckle in, but let's read (laughs) the whole passage. So from verse six. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in faith as he were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow philosophies and deceptive philosophies which depend on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by flesh, was put off when your circumcision by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him, through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were raised in your, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your f- flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or Sabbath days. They, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about ha- what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual minds. They have lost connection with their heads, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental sport- spiritual forces of this world, why? as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with yeast, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have the appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body but they lack value in restraining sensual indulgence. Paul talks about the most important thing first, being rooted in Christ. And if you're a note taker, that's our first subheading today. Before talking about how to guard yourself against deception from the world, our second subheading. And then finally, deception from within the church and from ourselves. The culture that we live in has such a high regard for like quantifying success instantly. We want to know that what we have done has results as soon as we have done done it. And I think this culture can be seen in the church too. And I think it's made us oversimplify what being a Christian is. We often just count hands raised in a response time to an evangelistic talk or maybe tick that checkbox that says, I've prayed the sinner's prayer once, and now I'm sorted. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, I'm not going to hell, silver bullet, all done. Rather than actually measuring the true success of people growing in their relationship with Jesus, or people moving along their journey to say faith. In verse six, it says, so then just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. 
We've got to remain in him. It's not just a one-time commitment. And Paul uses the idea of trees rooted in soil to illustrate this. I work in the Pear Tree Cafe um, in the Ashton Hall Garden Centre, if you know it, and my commute to work is along the canal. So I go up the canal onto the Ashton Road um, every day. And it's a pretty nice commute as like it goes, and I cycle it. Um, but there's one section of the path where there's some pretty new tarmac, but there's just this massive bump because this like gigantic like m- mega tree root has grown under the tarmac and pushed it all upwards. So it's like a huge bump. And it's actually so dangerous. In the winter, when I cycle back in the dark, I don't really know quite where it is. <laughs> so I'm holding onto my handlebars, hoping it won't chuck me off when it comes up any second, filled with dreaded anticipation. But it makes me laugh because there is, that tree has been rooted at any cost. Not even a turn of tarmac. I think there's so many times when like, workers have come to try and remove it, can get rid of that tree root. And Paul uses this idea to paint a picture. He talks about the fact that a strong tree must have strong roots in strong ground. If it doesn't, how can it weather a storm? And how can it get the nutrients that it needs to grow? Our roots being in Christ means that he is our foundation and he is what makes us strong. And actually, we should be getting our nutrients from him, which is much easier said than done. When you've had a really long day and you're desperate for rest, do you actually want to go and sit in his presence and maybe listen to some worship music? Or do you want to lie in bed and watch Netflix? Or if you need comfort, do you sit and pray, Lord, comfort me? Or do you eat a massive bowl of pasta like I do? Or when you need money, do you pray for Jehovah Jireh, the provider, to give you what you need? Or do you become really tight-fisted and ungenerous with what you have? For a tree, everything comes from the roots, and that's its foundation. And that's what it should be for us with Christ. This year has been a year of not knowing for me been uncertain on a lot of things. I didn't really know what I wanted to do for a career. I didn't know what city to live live in. I didn't know where to live. I didn't really have an idea of what the future was going to look like at all. And sometimes that's been easy to trust God. And actually, I've just accepted God's got a plan for me, and that is good. And that's been really valuable. But other times, it's been much harder particularly when last Wednesday I knew I was moving out on Monday but didn't have anywhere to live yet. Side note, such good news. Me and Sim have found a place to live and I love it so much and it was just God's perfect timing and his abundant provision. But in those times where I was struggling to trust God with all those unanswered questions, there was one day where I sat down and just thought, I'll write down the times before when I've not known what's come in and like it's worked out okay. So I sat down and I wrote down, you know, the obvious bullet point that comes to mind straight away. But then I wrote down another one and another one. And I just ended up feeling it's like a whole page of times where I've really not known which way to go. And God has been so faithful. And I was just so grateful, like so grateful for God for his faithfulness. I think there's a positive feedback loop with thankfulness and closeness to Christ. The fact that the more thankful we are, the closer to Christ we become. And the closer we are to Christ, the more thankful we are as well. And I think this is what Paul is talking about in verse 7 when he talks about overflowing with thankfulness. And when we're thankful and close to Christ, we're protected from deception. So that's the most important way to protect yourself from deception. Stick to Jesus, not just one time, but always stick to him, being rooted in him, letting him be your strength and your foundation and where you get what you need, overflowing with thankfulness and being close to him. This gives us such a strong base for not being deceived. Like in a battle, you get to stand next to the strongest warrior, which is why if I was in the Lord of the Rings, you wouldn't find me far away from Aragorn at all. (laughs) So that's our first point done. Moving on to countering deception from the world. I didn't actually start a timer, so we'll see how this is going. (laughs) Um, So, um, the church in Colossae were being bombarded with so many different philosophies and worldviews and novel ways of thinking from all over. Does that sound familiar at all to your life? 
that actually we are being overwhelmed with other people's beliefs and philosophies and novel ideas and kind of feel like people are out to get you. They're always trying to convince you that they are right, that they see things the right way and you don't. And the Church of Colossae were just exposed to so many different gods and their response to that was often just to add Jesus into the mix, you know. They'll worship this idol and that idol. They'll worship this person and that ancestor. And they'll just worship Jesus as well as all those other things. Does that sound familiar? It's not so obvious because our idols don't look the same. But maybe Monday through Saturday we worship money and sex and entertainment and how we look and food. But then on Sunday mornings, you know, between 10 and 12, we worship God. That's our slot for Jesus. <laughs> the world is a place full of very clever people who have amazing ideas that are much smarter than anything that I can think of. So how on earth can we protect ourselves from being deceived from that? It says in verse 8, See that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the spiritual elements of this world rather than on Christ. So when it boils down to him, if you stumble across something really clever, if it's not Christ, it's not it. Even when it feels like the answer and feels super logical and rational and widespread, if it's not Christ, it's not it. And that's because Christ is so big that it is actually all about him. Take a look at verse 9 and 10 where it says, for, the, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. And there's also Proverbs 2, which you don't need to turn to. It just says, all wisdom comes from the Lord, and so does common sense and understanding. Jesus owns all wisdom, and he is in charge of it all. So earthly philosophies and things that we learn from the world, they might be helpful and they might be interesting, but ultimately they can only really be hollow, because it's all about Jesus anyway. The only wisdom that can be actually full and true is about Christ. So just be on your guard about wisdom from the world that doesn't talk about Christ, and that will prevent you from being deceived. This same verse talks about how we have fullness in Christ anyway. If you're carrying around an empty cup, it's very easy to fill it with things that aren't very good for you, you know, things that like aren't thirst quenching or life giving or fulfilling in any way. But if you have a full cup, it's already full, <laughs> and you're not going to be filling it with other things anyway. That's kind of how it is with us and our fullness in Christ. The fact that we have everything we need in Christ, let me stress that, we have everything we need in Christ, means that what does the world have to offer us anyway? We are already full, so we don't need this wisdom of the world from outside. Paul then goes on to talk about how we are separate from the world anyway. Our old selves are dead and gone. It talks about in verse 12 how the self that we had that was ruled by flesh has been buried with, the ba- with him in baptism in which you were raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. All the references to circumcision here are a bit confusing but they're all along those same lines. The fact that your old self, your old flesh is gone and you are new now with Christ. But this confuses me because it doesn't take a genius to realize that we are still in this world. And actually, when I was baptized in the baptismal pool, I came out and was still in my same body, even though I'm a new flesh. Because trust me, if you were a different body, I'd look a lot more like J-Lo right now. (laughs) So we have this weird tension to juggle about living both in the world and being separate from the world at the same time. But being separate from the world and knowing that this is not our home protects us from being overconsumed by it and deceived by it. The world is trying to convince us of all these new things or convince us to worship new things as well as Jesus or instead of Jesus. But frankly, we can protect ourselves from this deception by knowing that if it's not Christ, it's not it. Because the world is all about its creator that we are already full in Christ, so we don't need or want the wisdom the world has to offer, and we're separate from the world anyway.
Okay, coming into my last point now, so we're getting there. But the last point is about countering deception from the church and ourselves. I'm a bit of a biology geek. I studied biochemistry at university, and I'm pretty into immunology. Does anyone know what immunology is? It's the study of the immune system, so your body's defense to you know, all the germs around you. But I thought I'd give you a quick biology lesson, but I'm going to make it as simple as possible. So every cell is covered in antigens. So my cells have my antigens, your cells have your antigens, my cat's cells have her antigens, you know, bacteria cells have theirs, etc., etc., etc. And my immune system, what protects me from disease, knows what antigens are mine. So when a white blood cell is you know, wandering around my body and comes into contact with one of my own cells, it recognizes it by its antigens and it won't destroy it because they're friends. It's good to be there. But when something foreign enters my body, maybe Compilobacter, which is the cause of lots of food poisoning, enters. When the white blood cell sees the antigens on that, it realizes, oh, that is not our friend. I do not recognize that. And we'll destroy the cell and we'll mount an attack against it. That's one of the reasons cancer is actually so hard to treat, because cancer originates from our own cells. It's got our own antigens on it. Countering deception from the world is really difficult and it's cunning and sly, but at least it's covered in the world's antigens. You know where you got it from. But actually countering deception from in the church and from ourselves can be a lot harder because it's kind of covered in our own antigens. Do you ever see someone, maybe in this church or in churches in the past, and you think, oh gosh, I wish I could be as spiritual as them. I bet they read their Bibles so much. Oh, God just talks to them so loud. Why won't he talk to me as loud as he talks to them? And sometimes it's legit. You do get people who like, just display Jesus so clearly. But we should be warned, and Paul does this in verse 18 and 19, that actually it's not always what it looks like. People can look very spiritual, but actually be disconnected from God be separate from Christ, be not rooted in Christ. Just because somebody looks very Christian doesn't mean you should believe everything they say. You should still be wary. There's countless times when actually Christians have been led astray by someone who seems really charismatic, but it's not preaching what's right, and it's sad. We've got to weigh up, you know, what they say, where even when they're in the church, test what they say about against scriptures and look at the fruit of their ministry even when it's in church. I was a nanny on and off for four years, um, and I nannied a seven-year-old girl who was too clever for her own good. Have you ever met little girls like that? A bit too clever. Um, And it was pizza wraps on the menu for dinner. Very easy to make. You put a wrap down, you put your tomato sauce on it, you put your cheese, your sweet corn, grill it, bish bash bosh, the simplest dinner in the world. She was determined she was going to help me make dinner. She was really holding on to this fact. So... I was like, yeah, fine, we won't fight this battle. You can help me. I gave her all the ingredients, and she put the wrap down, she put the tomato sauce down, and before she'd even put the cheese down, she managed to knock it off the counter. Of course it fell tomato sauce down. Sweep it all up in the bin, and she insisted that she tried again. So I gave her all the ingredients to try again, and she managed to assemble it this time. And as she was passing it to me so I could put it in the grill for her, She dropped it again. Tomato side side down, couldn't use it, all in the bin, start afresh. I begged her to just let me do it for her, but she refused. Once again, she had finally assembled a third pizza wrap this time. We got it in the grill. Phew. We got it cooked. I got it out of the grill. I sliced it up for her. She sat down on the table. I put the plate in front of her. All she had to do was pick up a slice and put it in her mouth. And she flicks the plate, all on the floor, but it's all upside down. At that moment, I could have grabbed her by the shoulders and shaken her. Stop helping me. Please, please stop helping me. In the church in Colossae, there was leaders who were convincing people that actually there was extra rules to the Christian life that you should follow to please God and to earn your salvation. And sometimes in churches, there's an undertone of the same thing. And I think we have our own natural inclination to be like, if we follow rules, maybe we can convince God to love us more. Or maybe we can earn our own salvation. 
But actually, I think God wants to grab us by the shoulders and shake us and be like, stop helping me. Because when you're trying to help me, you're just adding complications of pride and guilt. Just accept the freedom that I've won for you. Verse 20 and 21 says, since you died with Christ to the spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong in this world, do you submit to its walls? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. We are already free. So why do we try and put ourselves in chains? Stop doing that and accept the freedom that Christ has won for you. We've got to be on our guard from this because it's kind of a lifelong journey. We realize and have a moment of revelation that we are free and we don't have to follow rules because of what God has won for us. But then we forget and we start trying to follow rules to win our freedom again. But then we have a revelation again, and it's just a journey, so we need to be aware of it, so we don't get deceived by people in the church or by our natural inclination. So, in conclusion, thank you for bearing with me. Um, We've looked at how the church in Colossae were being deceived. Sounds familiar, right? And the best way, if you only take one thing away from it, this is it, to not be deceived is to stick firmly to Christ to be rooted in him. We've got to guard ourselves against deception from the world. It's not Christ, it's not it. We're already full, we're separate from the world, so we don't need its wisdom anyway. And we've got to guard ourselves from deception in the church and from ourselves, from people who look super spiritual but maybe aren't the real deal, and from people who tell us that there's more rules to follow, because actually we're free. Let me pray. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Heavenly Father, thank you that actually there's nothing that we can do to convince you to love us more. Thank you, God, that you have completely won our freedom for us. And thank you, God, that when we are near you and close to you, we are protected and we are safe. That although this world is a scary place to live in and everything that we see is difficult to navigate, Lord, you are with us and you help us and we are really safe in your arms. Lord, help us to realise that fully and to marvel on your glory and what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.